Trinity Vicarage Larceny. One fine spring morning, Sherlock Holmes and I received into our rooms a portly gentleman in a purple dress. That at least is how it momentarily appeared to me, as I glanced up from the Daily Chronicle at the open door. The purple gentleman, it transpired, was the Right Reverend the Lord Bishop of Kent, an old acquaintance of Holmes, and he had brought with him, as so many of our visitors do, a problem that was clearly causing him some agitation. Mollified a little by coffee and a cigar, Bishop Spriggs needed no prompting to divulge his story. The nub of my problem, gentlemen, is an unfortunate young priest, a young man of promise and talent very popular with his parishioners, who has inadvertently got himself into deep water. Intriguing, said Holmes. You may recall, the clergyman continued, that Trinity Church in the Kent village of Hatchingham was last year in the news because of an exceptional discovery. Of course, I said. A silver chalice of considerable worth was discovered in the crypt. Yes, Dr. Watson, a magnificent medieval relic, the so-called Hatchingham Grail weighing some twenty-two pounds. With my approval, it was sold to the British Museum, with the idea that a good portion of the proceeds would go towards restoring Hatchingham Church. The Reverend Kingsley, pending the beginning of the building work, had locked the money up in the church crypt. It was stolen yesterday. Holmes, you can imagine what an outcry they'd be if this found its way into the papers. It would be bad for Kingsley... And the Hatchingham Parish, and goodness alone knows what it would do for the reputation of the church. At any cost, the money must be recovered and the thief put away. And I mean any cost, Holmes. Let us not concern ourselves with fees just yet, Holmes said. Are there any clues at all as to who might be responsible for this theft? I'm not sure about clues, replied the clergyman. Kingsley did make some sort of an attempt to discover the identity of the villain by chasing him over the fields after the theft, but I'm afraid he didn't get very far. I think we had better meet the young reverend, said Holmes, as soon as is practical. Watson, would you be at liberty to accompany me to Hatchingham for a few days? I'm utterly indebted to you both, said the bishop. I dare say while you're in Hatchingham, we could put you up at the Trinity Church Rectory. Or oh, there's the jolly bulldog, if you'd prefer an inn. Ah, said Holmes, the jolly bulldog. Now that sounds like just my kind of animal. We journeyed to Hatchingham the next morning and established ourselves at the cosy but crumbling hostelry that was the jolly bulldog. Our landlord was a bluff man called Starkey taller by inches than Holmes, and compelled to stoop to avoid the beams of his own ceiling as he lumbered about in heavy boots serving his customers. He grudgingly provided us with a late snack of bread and some rather tough cold meats, complaining that if everyone chose to be fed at half past two in the afternoon they would have to invent a new word for the meal taken between luncheon and dinner. Leftovers, said Holmes to me impishly and at a level which I am sure Starkey was meant to overhear. Might be that word? The publican growled ominously as he left us, and I leaned over to Holmes and whispered, There is surely an example of how a little power may go to the head of a man and make him too big for his boots. I was thinking rather, said Holmes, from the way he clumps about this place, that his boots are rather too big for him. I saw the two gentlemen on a nearby table smile at this remark. "'I shouldn't take a lot of notice of Starkey,' said one of them amiably. "'He's just as tiresome with all the customers.' The gentleman introduced himself as John Hapton and his companion as Matthew Winslow. Although neither Holmes nor myself disclosed the details of our mission to Hatchingham, it seems they knew we were expected, and it turned out that both gentlemen were members of the parish committee and were fully apprised of the theft, though they were quick to assert that it was not yet public knowledge. I hope you will be successful, said Hapton, in bringing this thief to book. We are fond of our vigour, and he has been a deeply troubled young man since it happened.
The Reverend Kingsley's house was accessed from Hatchingham Lane by a short stone path. A few steps beyond the vicarage stood the church, with, on the west side, a moderate-sized graveyard. On the other side, with its own access to the lane and shaded by a handful of fruit trees, stood Cherry Cottage, which we would later discover to be the residence of the verger and his wife. The Reverend Kingsley was a man in his early thirties, small in stature but of good looks, his clerical dress the quintessence of neatness. While clearly stricken by his predicament, he remained calm and articulate and did his best to make us welcome in a pleasantly appointed parlour whose deep-coloured, thick-piled carpet and embroidered cushions evidenced a delicate sense of taste. "'It's a relief to see you, gentlemen,' he said. "'The bishop told me all about you, about your many successes in solving complex cases. The problem, as you know, is that while we saw the thief escape, we were unable to establish his identity. However, there are one or two factors which, though they seem opaque to my own consideration, might prove illuminating under your own, if I might show you. I would be most grateful, Mr. Kingsley, Holmes said. First, though, I see that you have recently held a meeting in this charming room. I presume that apart from the three other gentlemen present, the fourth was yourself? You keep the side chairs in another room, I take it. Lord, how did you know all that? Oh, it's a simple matter. The carpet beside the window has indentations of four chairs, and therefore I presume four, four people, but there are no chairs in the room whose feet would match. Well, yes, you are. Of course, quite correct, said Kingsley with a broad smile. The parish committee convened here just yesterday, as, as we do each week. Yesterday was the day I broke the news that the Grail money had been stolen and I hope that that news will remain privy to the committee members until such time as the thief is caught, but... The vicar paused, and Holmes said, Please, go on, Mr. Kingsley. But, continued the young clergyman, the gentlemen on the parish committee are the same three who sat here two weeks ago when I revealed that the money for the grail was in the crypt of the church. Only they and I knew of the fact, you see, so... I can no longer be as confident as before that they are all honest men, which is a most unfortunate thing. It was all in cash, I presume, Holmes said. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I kept cash so that I could employ local men to restore the church and pay them by the day. I have little time to run to the bank and make a withdrawal every time a man finishes plastering a wall. The money was under lock and key. Yes. There is a safe in the crypt where the church's small treasures have always been secreted. And the crypt itself is locked. Yes, it can be entered either from within the church or by a door leading from the churchyard, and both those doors are locked at night. Mr. Holmes, I do hope you can help me with this. I don't know how my flock will ever forgive me if that money is not returned. Then perhaps, if you can bear to go over it all again, you'd be so kind as to tell Dr. Watson and myself the circumstances of the robbery. Yes, of course. Two weeks ago, looking out of this window, on a Monday morning at about eleven, I saw a man, I'm fairly certain it was a man, standing at the lich gate and looking over into the churchyard. I would not have given this a moment's thought, except that he wore a hat with an unusually wide brim, and had it pulled so low over his eyes, and his collar so high, that one could not distinguish his features. As I say, I cannot even be certain it was not a woman— except for his way of moving. I watched him for a good ten minutes before he turned and strode back along the lane towards the village. That same afternoon, this time from an upstairs window, I saw him again, but now further along the lane, standing under a tree and once again seeming to study the church and its grounds. His contrived anonymity naturally put me on my guard. In the evening after those first two sightings, I was sitting in that very chair, Dr. Watson, which you are currently occupying, when a thought hit me like a bolt of lightning, a thought which you no doubt will be surprised had not occurred to me earlier, that this stranger might have designs on the money in the crypt. After this alarming epiphany, I spoke to my verger, Sam Manners, and his wife, May, who keep house for me. They live in Cherry Cottage, which, as you will have seen, stands on the lane beside the church's lich gate. 
There's a shortcut from their back door to this house, which they employ when they wish to see me. I mention that because, as I think you will agree, it bears upon the matter. I asked them to report to me if this sinister figure, or anyone else unknown to them, appeared in the vicinity of the church. And indeed, it seems as if the man in that hat had begun to watch my whereabouts, because first May Manners, then her husband, reported to me that they had indeed seen the man in the hat. I began to feel that an attempt on the money was imminent. I resolved, then, to remain in the vicarage or the church grounds until I was certain that the threat had passed. I instructed Mr. and Mrs. Manners that if they saw the stranger again, they were to take the shortcut to my house and inform me immediately, but they were under no circumstances to approach him. And now we come to the day of the theft. Sam Manners was whitewashing the walls of the church. At this point, Holmes stood up. I think it would be as well, Mr. Kingsley, to acquaint ourselves with the geography of the church and its grounds. Might we continue outside? A rapturous afternoon of sunshine and birdsong greeted us as we left the vicarage and walked out into the churchyard where the Reverend Kingsley commenced our guided tour. I immediately began to locate us on a mental map of Hatchingham Village and its surrounding areas, a practice I learned in my military days and which has served me well in civilian life. I could see in my mind the large oblong of farmland, about two miles across, with Hatchingham Village and the church almost at opposite corners. This substantial area of land was surrounded on all four sides by public roads. Mr. Kingsley took us through the grounds on a grassy path which ran along the side of the church up against the gravestones of the churchyard. This is the wall of the church Sam Manners was painting that morning, said the vicar. He worked for a couple of hours, and at twelve o'clock I sent him off to his cottage for his regular midday meal. I went back into the vicarage and took up a book. After about twenty minutes there was a knock at the back door. Mrs. Manners was in a frantic state. She and Sam had just seen the man in the white-brimmed hat going into the churchyard. I told her to return immediately, and to tell Sam to meet me here at the crypt door, and I came here directly to find myself staring at a spectacular mess. He pointed to a flight of four steps just off the path, leading to a door low down in the half-painted church wall. The door to the crypt, he said, from which the thief must have made his exit, and not expecting to encounter a paint bucket, presumably kicked it flying in his haste to escape. A residual expanse of powdery white, still damp in places, stained the flagstones at the bottom of the steps. Sam was with me within seconds, continued the vicar. We could see nobody, but we soon guessed which way he'd gone. If you'll follow me, gentlemen. The vicar led us a little further along the grassy path, to where the churchyard ended in a wooden fence. Set into the fence was a stile leading on to a footpath. That, said the vicar, was his escape route. Beyond the stile, the ragged footpath traversed the meadow through weeds and rough grasses, stretching away into the distance. Along this narrow track could be seen intermittent blobs of white. And I suppose the presumption would be, said Holmes, that the trail of white paint marks are the fleeing man's footsteps. Yes, exactly. Obviously our man escaped across the field to Harding Lane, Mr. Holmes. My companion nodded. He stopped at the stile. There are two white handprints here, he said. A right hand and a left hand. The fellow is in some haste, as indeed one would expect. Holmes crossed the stile athletically, and walked a little way into the field. Bending down, he examined one of the white marks, then plucked up a handful of grass and returned to us. Thank you, Mr. Kingsley. I think I've seen all I need to here. Is there anything else you think might help us? Yes, said the vicar enthusiastically. Back at the house. Holmes requested that Sam Manners and his wife join us in the vicarage, and a little afterwards in Mr. Kingsley's kitchen. Mrs. Manners set herself to the task of making us all tea, while Holmes paced the stone floor slowly. I sat at the kitchen table with the vicar and Sam Manners, a ruddy man in his early forties, whom Holmes was now addressing. So, Mr. Manners, you are the only person to have caught a glimpse of the man in the hat on the day of the robbery. I believe so, sir. I was at the window, taking my lunch, 
I saw this fellow in the big hat looking up and down the lane a few times as if to check all was clear, then enter the churchyard. Straight away I said to Mrs. Manners to go by the back door and tell the vicar, and you yourself waited in the cottage until Mrs. Manners returned. I did, sir. For how long? Not more than two minutes. She told me the vicar wanted me to meet him out by the church. I dashed right out. And found the Reverend Kingsley waiting for you? Yes, sir. And the door to the crypt wide open, whitewash everywhere. Hmm. The crypt door had been locked before you went to lunch. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, it always was. And that was when you noticed the trail of paint. Exactly, sir, and set off to follow it. You must have only been a short way behind the thief. Must have been, sir, but he moved like the wind. We was across that meadow in less than five minutes. It was a good four furlongs and never caught up to him. But what we found at the opposite side clinched it. Here Mr. Kingsley interrupted. Sam means this, he said, and produced from a drawer a wide-brimmed black velvet hat, inexpensively made and in shape rather resembling the sort of thing one sees worn by picadors in pictures of bullfights. Holmes took the hat and turned it around in his hands. It was me found it, sir, said Manners. I was running a bit ahead of the reverend, hoping to catch up with our thief, and as soon as I was over the stile I saw it in the grass by the road, just where I suppose it had fallen from his head. Well, said Holmes, while I cannot see yet how that will help us, with your permission I shall take it away with me. Of course, said the vicar. We'll leave you then, but by way of that path across the fields. I'd rather like to follow the route taken by our escaping felon. And so it was that we made our farewells and set out from the churchyard across the wide meadow towards Harding Lane. Although it had been a week since the church thief had fled, there remained a clear trail of white footprints across the entire width of the field. The path ended at another stile, which gave on to the shaded narrowness of Harding Lane. We calculated that to return to Hatchingham Village we could go in either direction around the perimeter of the meadow. We took the route west along the Pincham Road rather than going east and back via the church. As we walked, my companion looked repeatedly this way and that into the fields at the roadside, the patches of scrubland, and the bushes and trees. If you note anything, you must let me know, Watson. And I agreed that I would. But the fields lay bright and innocent in the late afternoon air, and the trees were populated only by birds jubilantly enjoying the sunshine. Then, as we crossed a bridge over a gurgling stream, Holmes stopped halfway. There's something there. Do you see? He pointed to the bank of the stream, above which a hawthorn overhung the rushing water. Something that bush. A pair of somethings, unless I'm mistaken. We clambered over the balustrade of the little bridge and dropped onto the bankside. The hawthorn was thick, and even at close quarters my eyes were at pains to penetrate into its depths. Holmes, using a fallen branch the thickness of his arm, smashed his way into the bush. His soft cry of triumph told me he had found something, and he reached in and retrieved in one hand a large pair of leather boots. What do you think, Watson? Is this or is this not the footwear of our thief? They're certainly large, those of a very big man, I should say, and there are white marks on the soles. Shall we see how they fit those prints on the church meadow? I think we can assume that much, Watson. But what would induce the villain to jettison his boots here? Perhaps, I said, he thought he was still being chased, and knew that if he were caught wearing them he would be recognized straight away. "'Equally suspicious if he'd been found with no boots at all,' said Holmes, "'though I suppose he may have carried a spare pair of shoes with him. "'Watson, it is fairly clear to me the thief is a local man. "'Why, unless he feared to be recognized, would he indulge in such an elaborate disguise? "'Let us go back to the Jolly Bulldog. "'That, after all, is where the locals like to congregate.' In fact, on our return to the inn, we found John Hapton and Matthew Winslow, the parish committee men we had met earlier, having returned to, or perhaps never having left, the same table. As we sat down, Holmes placed beside him on the floorboards the pair of boots we had found in the hedgerow, causing the two gentlemen to look at them inquisitively. 
When Starkey, the landlord, arrived to serve us, the first thing he said was, "'Your boats, gentlemen?' "'Not ours,' said Holmes. "'We found them in a bush in Harding Lane.' "'Strange what some folks will throw away,' said the publican. "'They looks in prime order to me.' "'Hardly been worn,' Holmes replied. And then he asked, "'Would these boots fit you, Mr. Starkey?' And seeing our companions on the nearby table watching, he added, "'Or either of you, gentlemen?' "'Not me, sir,' Starkey replied, rather more amiably than I had expected. "'I know my boots look weighty, but my feet ain't so big as you might think. "'It's just I'm subject to blisters.' "'But you find big boots help your blisters?' I asked, "'my experience of patients suffering with that condition telling me the opposite. "'No, sir.' To start the blisters, I need to put on three pairs of thick hose, so I always gets my boots well over my proper foot size. Then, rather sardonically, he said, Thank you, though, for asking, sir. Mr. Hapton, on the next table, asked, Do you mind me asking you, sir, what's your interest in boots? Holmes said, It's an investigation we are conducting in which boots have, well, some scientific significance. Then to me he whispered as our neighbour turned away with a disbelieving grimace. It's as I thought, Watson. We have our culprit. Starkey? No, no, not Starkey. One of these? And I indicated with my thumb the two men from the parish committee. No, Watson. Who, then? These boots, Watson, do you observe nothing untoward about them? No, not at all. They're practically new. They're of a large size. Apart from that, they are undistinguished. On the contrary, my friend, I would say they were distinguished by a lack of paint. I beg your pardon? I mean, Watson, that there are white marks on the soles, to be sure. But tell me, pray, how a man with his hands covered in whitewash could have unlaced and removed his boots without leaving marks on the laces? I don't know, I said. But it would be a singular coincidence if someone completely innocent had jettisoned a pair of boots with paint on the soles. There is no coincidence, Holmes said. These boots were undoubtedly left here by the thief, but not in the way we were intended to believe. Are you suggesting that you know who the thief is? The thief, Watson, is the Reverend Kingsley himself. But how could it be, Holmes? There was no time for him to escape across that meadow and return to the vicarage in time to meet Sam Manners outside the church. How could a man chase himself across a meadow? As you know, Watson, we are due to meet the bishop this evening at Trinity Vicarage. So let us finish our meal. I will explain everything there. We had promised the bishop an interim meeting at the vicarage to advise him of our progress in the case— which no doubt the clergyman expected to be only moderate this soon after our previous meeting. But we had hardly settled to our sherry in Mr. Kingsley's comfortable parlour than Holmes declared dramatically, You will no doubt be delighted to know, gentlemen, that Dr. Watson and I have solved the case. I did not think it my business to confess that after my previous conversation with Holmes I was as much in the dark as anyone— but I sat quietly sipping my sherry while I watched my friend open the bag we had brought from the inn and remove the two large white-stained boots we had found beside the stream. The bishop's eyes widened. I have to say he looked incredulous. Mr. Kingsley, too, wore a sceptical smirk and raised his eyebrows. Please tell us, Mr. Holmes, what you think you have found? Dr. Watson and I found these, Holmes explained in a bramble-bush in Harding Lane. Big boots suggested we were seeking a big man, yet the footprints told us his stride was short. It was our landlord at the Jolly Bulldog who enabled me to understand the dichotomy. He is a man who buys bigger boots than his foot size in order to accommodate extra socks. Our villain, however, bought his bigger boots in order to accommodate another pair of shoes, leaving the footprints of a bigger man than he is himself. Is that not so? Mr. Kingsley. The young vicar, I thought at the time, if he was guilty of anything, was heroically cool about it. He betrayed nothing but genteel surprise. Are you suggesting that I was the thief, Mr. Holmes? Holmes, said the bishop gravely, 
From what I understand, Mr. Kingsley and his verger practically managed to catch up with the thief on that fateful day. What on earth do you think is the evidence for this assertion? My lord, Holmes said confidently, Mr. Kingsley wished to embezzle the money raised by the sale of the Hatchingham Grail and decided to construct a piece of theatre which would deceive investigators. He not only invented the spectral man in the large-brimmed hat, he also on several occasions paraded in the hat and the high-collared coat and ensured that Mr. and Mrs. Manners caught a glimpse of him. On the day of the theft, having sent Sam Manners to lunch, he came back here to the vicarage, assumed the disguise, showed himself at the cottage window where Manners was eating, and proceeded into the churchyard. Dashing back to the vicarage again, he slipped out of his cloak and hat and waited for Mrs. Manners' knock on the door. He told Mrs. Manners to summon her husband and rendezvoused with him outside the crypt door. And then what? said Mr. Kingsley, insolent with fury. I put on these boots, unlocked the church, went down to the crypt, took the money, escaped the church, jumped the stile, and ran across a mile of the field, then dashed a mile back, took off the boots, and waited calmly for Sam to arrive, whereupon I went chasing off across the field again. That would indeed have been ingenious, to do in two minutes what an athlete could not do in twenty. Yes, indeed. The question, as my friend Dr. Watson has clarified, is precisely... How may a man chase himself across a meadow? And the answer, asked the bishop. No one will ever know at what point you took the money, Mr. Kingsley. As the keyholder, you are free to do it at your leisure. And, for all one knows, it may never have been in the crypt safe in the first place. Certainly there was no need for you to waste time on it on the day we are discussing. You wished to ensure there was just enough time with Mr. Manners at lunch for you to get to the crypt door and kick over the whitewash bucket. And, of course, you had given Mr. Manners the task of whitewashing that particular part of the church wall, simply to ensure that there would be a bucket there to be upturned. That was all you needed to do, because, and here is the thing, you had made the footprints across the field on the night before. You had also, I have no doubt, planted the boots in the hedgerow on the same occasion, making sure they had plenty of white paint on the soles. Foolishly, you forgot to daub a little on the shoe laces. At this point, the vicar dropped into a chair as though all resistance had suddenly fled him, and I believe that as Holmes proceeded, we all realized that he was now approaching a devastating conclusion. At some hour of that night, Mr. Kingsley, having splashed so much whitewash on the underside of the boots that your hands were gloved with paint, you planted your white-printed trail along the footpath across the meadow to Harding Lane. Afterwards, you dropped the wide-brimmed hat by the stile and jettisoned the boots in a bush further along Harding Lane. The trail of prints was therefore neatly in place for the deception next morning, and I dare say you were solicitous to keep Mr. Manners away from the stile, where he might prematurely stumble upon your, if I may so misname it, handiwork. But one moment, said the bishop. If Mr. Kingsley had dropped the hat the night before, how could he have been wearing it that morning? Well, of course, that's simple, said Holmes. There were two hats. And finally, there was the question of the keys. What question was that, Holmes? I asked. I don't recollect any mention of keys. Precisely. There was a distinct absence of any such mention. Why? Because a key would have been needed to enter the crypt, and Mr. Kingsley thought it better not to raise the tricky matter of how such an intruder might have got hold of one. The pale face and slumped figure of Mr. Kingsley indicated his utter defeat. The bishop clearly needed no further convincing. "'The money, Kingsley,' he said. "'Have you spent it?' The vicar looked bitter. "'I'm a gambler, bishop. And the truth is that over the years I have burdened myself with appalling debts. I started to use the church money bit by bit. I meant to return it one day when I had a big win, but money runs through my hands like water. There's little of it left. Then it's a matter for the police, the bishop said, and we must find a new vicar for Hatchingham. I fear that you, Mr. Kingsley, 
will for many years be the incumbent of a much dingier parish. <laughs>